Okay, we're still talking about infinitesimal quantities, and we've said that they show up in the history of mathematics as far back as Archimedes. But there are also other mathematicians who used them, including two of our favorites, Newton and Leibniz. Newton referred to them as fluxions, and Leibniz referred to them as differentials. And he wrote them as these little quantities that we're already familiar with, dx and dy. So the notation that we use uh, comes, from, comes from Leibniz. Now Newton and Leibniz were not doing limits. The mathematics of limits was developed later to address some of these issues, but Newton and Leibniz had an intuitive understanding of how to use them. Kind of like the way I've been arguing, that, uh, that you can have a dy and a dx and calculate a little slope as a dy over dx. But a lot of people had and still have a problem with that. And in particular, the philosopher George Berkeley. Oh, actually his name, even though it's spelled B-E-R-K-E-L-E-Y, I believe it's properly pronounced um, Barclay, George Barclay. So let's say it that way, George Barclay. He lived in the, the late 1600s, uh, early 1700s, so a little bit after Newton. He, his life overlapped with Newton. But, um, but he was highly opposed to the use of these quantities in the way Newton and Leibniz were using them. And, and Berkeley was, Berkeley was a significant thinker too, more of a philosopher and a theologian than a mathematician, although he also had significant works mathematically. And in 1734, he published a work called The Analyst. And in this work, he attacked what he referred to as an infidel an infidel mathematician, which is presumed to be Newton, or it might have been Newton's friend Edmund Halley. And he didn't just attack the mathematician, he attacked the mathematics itself. And his criticism of Newton's thinking is not bad. Both his, his uh, philosophical reasoning and his mathematical reasoning are worth commenting on. Um, Berkeley was a devout Christian and he saw himself as defending Christianity against attacks from a materialistic universe that Newton was describing. Now, Newton himself was a Christian, a very devout Christian, and studied the Bible thoroughly. But his ideas uh, spawned a lot of thinking that opposed Christianity. And in particular, think about Newton's physics. Newton explained the theory of planetary orbits how the planets moved around the sun, basically coasting around the sun under the influence of gravity. So all of these objects in the heavens, all of the stars and planets, moved according to their momentum, their inertia, and the forces acting on them. So their motions were determined entirely by their initial motion. So the position of the moon, for example, depends on where it was a moment ago and which way it's moving. And the position of the moon in the future depends on where it is now and which way it's moving. And so the motion of the moon is just unfolding in a mechanistic fashion according to the laws of physics. So this whole description of the universe involved this materialistic, and by, by materialistic I mean the material world only, the, the, the natural world. And it involves nothing of the supernatural world, the motions of the, the heav heavenly bodies, and then also the motions of things here on earth. You throw an object, it moves in a parabolic path in the absence of air resistance, or in the presence of air resistance, it moves according to the forces acting on it. And its motion is entirely determined by those forces acting on it. And so philosophers saw this universe as unfolding, as little particles, little atoms, banging against each other, and simply moving according to the laws of physics. And you could imagine the entire history of the universe, including this video, is simply the unfolding of atoms moving according to laws and these motions were predestined to follow a certain path from the initial motions at the beginning of the universe and everything is simply unfolding according to the laws of physics and so philosophers such as Berkeley saw Newtonian mechanics 
as this rigid closed system that left no place for God or for anything supernatural. And even though Newton would not have interpreted it that way, interpreted it that way, people saw that as a flaw in Newtonian mechanics. They saw that it was too mechanistic, too deterministic, and left no room for anything supernatural. And so Berkeley saw himself as defending Christianity when he was attacking this infidel mathematician and attacking the calculus. Now Berkeley wasn't just a philosopher and theologian. Remember I also said he was a mathematician. And he had a pretty reasonable mathematical argument as well. And it would go something like this. He would Barclay would say that, that Newton and Leibniz would present calculus something like this. Let's say we have a function like this, f of x is x squared. Okay, and let's calculate the derivative. So the calculation of the derivative would be this, f of x plus dx minus f of x over dx. And so let's put in x squared here in for this into this function. So the derivative would look like this. f primed would be x plus dx squared minus f of x over dx. And let's work that out. Well, if we just square x plus dx, we get x squared plus 2x dx plus dx squared minus f of x, and f of x, remember, is x squared, so it's minus x squared over dx. And then you can see this x squared and the minus x squared cancel out, and so we have 2x dx plus dx squared over dx, and then we can cancel out a dx. You see we have a dx here and two of them there, so we can factor out a dx and cancel it with that. And then we get then we get 2x plus dx, and we can ignore this dx because it is infinitely small compared to this 2x. This thing doesn't really matter, so we can just strike it out, and we get the derivative is 2x. And we know that's correct, right? If f of x is x squared, then the derivative is 2x. So this is uh, the thought process that Newton and Leibniz might present for a derivative. Then Berkeley would say this. He would say, aha, look here. First, you're treating dx as a non-zero quantity. Whenever you have it in the denominator here, it's not zero. You're dividing by dx as if it's not zero. And then right here, you're ignoring it as if it is zero. And you can't have it both ways. There's a contradiction there. If dx is zero, you can't divide by it. If dx is non-zero, you can't ignore it and cross it out. Now that's a pretty good argument and a lot of people buy that argument and still buy that argument and that argument certainly has some weight and that's that's the type of thinking that led to the formulation of the theory of limits. So later on uh, Augustin Cauchy, that's C-A-U-C-H-Y, he was in the, the late 1700s, well he was born in the late 1700s, did his work in the early 1800s and then Weierstrauss who was about the same time, a little bit later, 18, 1800s, his entire life was in the 1800s. Cauchy, interestingly, a homeschool student, and Weierstrauss, both of these um, significant mathematicians, they reformulated the development of calculus in terms of limits. So they would have said that f primed is the definition that we've learned. It is the limit as x approaches zero of f of x plus delta x minus f of x over delta x. And there's no, oh, I should say the limit as, a, as delta x approaches zero. And so delta x is just approaching zero. It never quite gets there. So we don't have the problem of dividing by zero. And of course, this formula, we've seen this, it works out to give the correct derivative. And that's the definition of derivative that's still used today. And I point this out to, to say where this comes from. The development of this definition of a derivative came from these type of problems that were pointed out about Newton's and Leibniz's calculus. Newton and Leibniz certainly developed calculus and it certainly works and they had this intuitive understanding that I hope you are grasping in this course as well. 
But because there were these philosophical problems with it and these issues of is this dx quantity really zero and can we divide by it, because of that people were motivated, people such as Cauchy and Weierstrass were motivated to reformulate the whole thing and put it on a more rigorous foundation, the theory of limits. And that's what we have today and that is why most calculus textbooks and most calculus courses begin with a, a unit on limits because that is the the foundation on which the rest of calculus logically rests now here's my personal view on all of this I would argue that limits are not necessary and, and I know a lot of calculus teachers if they watch this video they're probably cringing when they hear me say that but I've got some pretty good evidence on my side uh, Newton and Leibniz for example they developed calculus without the theory of limits and they did calculus and it was immediately recognized as very useful and was immediately employed to do real work and solve real real problems it wasn't until 150 years later that it was put on the theory put on a foundation based on the theory of limits now I don't mean to criticize the theory of limits. It's it's certainly valid theory, and it does in fact provide a logical underpinning that it, that has a high degree of mathematical rigor and logical rigor on which calculus can rest. But consider the fact that if you bring it on up to the 1960s and look at the work of people like Abraham Robinson, uh, Robinson did what is commonly referred to as non-standard analysis with the standard analysis being the approach dealing with the theory of limits so the non-standard analysis is something different than the standard analysis and Robinson uh, was doing math with infinitely small numbers dx and dy and the reciprocals of those numbers which would be infinitely large and he expanded the set of numbers beyond the real numbers and included what we would call hyper real numbers and those would be these infinitely small and infinitely large numbers and he did show that there is a rigorous method of dealing with these things that corresponds to the intuitive understanding that Newton and Leibniz had with them and he was able to demonstrate mathematically and I cannot uh, put forth any of his arguments I have not studied this thoroughly but I do know that Robinson showed in a rigorous fashion using these concepts of hyper real numbers that the intuitive understanding of dx and dy is infinitely small numbers but not quite zero that Newton and Leibniz had is mathematically and formally correct and in fact Robinson said that his goal in studying all of this was to get inside Leibniz's head and to thoroughly understand his thinking and and since Robinson there have actually been other rigorous methods of showing that dx and dy are valid mathematical concepts and are consistent with Leibniz's and Newton's intuition so so I rest my point that that you can that you can do this dy over dx that you can think of that as a quotient dy divided by dx and even if you consider dx to be infinitely small that's okay as demonstrated by Newton and Leibniz developing the calculus and getting it right and as demonstrated by Abraham Robinson in his non-standard analysis that that is okay and other rigorous methods of showing the same thing have been developed since Robinson as well and so we'll end the historical interlude there and next we'll get back to the calculus